This episode is brought to you by the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation and its Montana-based AMB West Philanthropies, both of which embody the value-based approach to philanthropy and business of their chairman, Arthur M. Blank. The foundation is doing excellent and impactful work in Montana and beyond, so I encourage you to check out their website at blankfoundation.org to learn more. Thanks a lot. Hey, this is Ed Robertson, and this is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast, where I introduce you to some of the innovative individuals who are shaping the future of the American West. I meet most of these people through my work in land conservation, or through my hobbies and interests that revolve around spending time up high in the mountains. My guests include ranchers, writers, entrepreneurs, conservationists, athletes, artists, adventurers, pretty much anyone who's doing important work, has an interesting story, and loves the American West. My guest today is Matt Pearson. Matt is a fifth-generation Montana rancher who owns and operates Highland Livestock Company alongside his wife and two sons. He's also the founder and president of the Producer Partnership, a newly formed nonprofit organization that brings together farmers and ranchers with the goal of ending hunger in Montana. Since its start in the spring of 2020, the Producer Partnership has given away tens of thousands of pounds of beef to Montana food banks, and is creating replicable, scalable solutions for fighting hunger throughout the West and beyond. The idea for the Producer Partnership was born in early 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was roiling communities and economies across the globe. With many Montana residents out of work and food banks struggling to keep up with the unprecedented demand, Matt decided to donate the meat from a cow he was planning to cull to his local food bank. He quickly recognized the direct positive impact that his donation had on the community, so he reached out to friends to drum up more donations. Within a month, he had directed 10,000 pounds of ground beef to area food banks. He kept going, and by the end of 2020, that number had risen to more than 53,000 pounds of beef. Through creativity, hard work, and an unyielding commitment to what Matt calls GSD, getting stuff done, Matt and his team at the Producer Partnership have created a new model for solving food insecurity in Montana. Matt and I connected virtually for a wide-ranging conversation that will be inspiring and educational for anyone interested in impactful, purpose-driven work. We started out talking about his family's long history in Montana, and then we moved into the details of how the Producer Partnership began. We talked about the challenges around processing meat, both during the early stages of the pandemic and now as well as the cutting-edge meat processing facility that the Producer Partnership is building. We talked about the scalability and replicability of the Producer Partnership model and how he expects the organization to evolve in the coming years. Matt talks about the importance of community, why he chooses to volunteer for causes ranging from youth soccer to Trout Unlimited, the future of agriculture, how he defines success on his ranching operation, and much more. This is a very inspiring episode, and I know you'll enjoy it. Go to ProducerPartnership.com to learn more about Matt and his work. And if you're so inclined, you can donate or buy Producer Partnership gear. Hope you enjoy this episode. Could you start out just talking a little bit about your family ranch and and kind of how you ended up doing what you're doing? Yeah, so we've been in Montana, obviously, for a long time. So on the ranch in Livingston... I am third generation. My boys are fourth. My great great grandfather homesteaded in Hobson, Montana. Um, so, you know, a little bit farther out there, but yeah. obviously we have been in Montana as near as I can tell since 1890 or 1892. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little tough to tell exactly sometimes when you're going through records. Uh, and so, obviously, a very good connection with this within the state, um, and a very big connection and in Livingston where we are, uh, especially bands that, you know, my kids are graduating high school where I graduated high school and, you know, sort of so on and so forth. And so, uh, been a big part of this community. And so that's kind of how this project got started. Um, in April of 20, the shelter in place order kind of hit and, uh, it was pretty evident, you know, what was going on and how the effect it was having in on the community. Mm-hmm. 
I have been a soccer coach in Livingston. This is actually my 25th year. Uh, just wrapped up uh, the high school girls soccer season here. And so having known all of these families and so many different people for so long, it was really clear what was what was happening and kind of how things were going down. And so we were wrapping up calving season here at the ranch and we were kind of trying to figure out things that we could do to help out because everybody here at the ranch, you know, we had been, you know, shelter in place during calving season as kind of a, <laughs> you couldn't even tell here. Yeah. <laughs> everybody was so everybody was so busy. We're always sheltered in place. Exactly. And so we were really trying to figure out things that we can do. And one of the guys made a joke. He's like, man, it's too bad. All this, all this food that we have walking around and, um, being sleep deprived and everything else. It still took another four hours before the comment really drove home in my brain. Like, hey, you know, all these call animals we have, we do have food around. We do have the ability to, you know, to make a difference. And so, uh, I was out driving tractor doing field work and, and just started calling around. And within a, within really under an hour, I had six spots reserved at the local processors and had more than enough animals to cover it. And, had talked to quite a few of the neighbors since I was just sort of driving around and and one of the neighbors is on the Park County Community Foundation board. And so he called his the president of his board and by the next morning those guys had called and said, Hey, we heard what you're trying to put together and we have thirty five hundred dollars of COVID money that we wanna we wanna kick your way to help pay for the processing. And I was like, Oh wow and uh, Gavin Clark not only sent me an email with sort of an invitation, but he sent it with like all of, with the uh, the application and all of the answers, more or less, I guess is the probably the best way to do. And to make kind of a long story short, we filled it all out. They started, they managed the money for us, and within six days from the startup idea, we'd raised over twelve thousand um, dollars, and I had the first eight hundred pounds of hamburger that went into Livingston Food Resource Center here locally, um, which is our food bank. And it really was one of those things that just took off. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the more the neighbors heard about it, the more they wanted to help, the more everything kind of just kind of fell into place. And really, we did all of that without advertising. You know, we weren't we weren't putting anything out in the paper or anything like that. We were just doing the work and, you know, people caught wind and it didn't take long before uh, Michael McCormick at the Livingston Food Resource Center is like, uh, Matt, our freezers are full. You're going to have to go somewhere else to spread this out a little bit. And so. We really started reaching out to all the neighboring communities and, you know, just sort of dropping it off everywhere that we could, you know, from Gardner to Billings to Big Timber, you know, kind of all of, all of, within probably a hundred mile radius of where we are. And, and real quick, are you using your personal, like your, your ranch vehicles for this or like, like who, who is actually doing the work? Yeah. Cause it, it's, you make it sound so, so easy, but it's, that's quite a, a logistical operation you're talking about. Yeah. So, you know, and I can tell all your listeners right now, they, they will now have heard from the luckiest person they've ever met. Um, I am so lucky to get to live where I do and do what I do and to be in a family that has been doing this for a long time, you know, so fortunate. And so we are so centrally located. It was really easy just to set up a pen in the corral to have neighbors drop animals off or I could just, if I was going by, I'd pick them up. And, and so for like picking up the hamburger, we used our vehicle, my wife and I did. And and just kind of picked it up at, at the processors, dropped it off at the food banks. And, you know, when it was just Livingston, it was pretty simple and straightforward. But then we started reaching out. We started kind of getting getting all over the place. And it, and it was probably along about that time that we picked up our first board member as we grew and or who would become our first board member. I mean, obviously we didn't even have a board of directors. We didn't have anything. Cause at that point there was so, no, no structure to it. It wasn't even like an LLC, no, no nonprofit. It was just it was, this idea was, and you're making it happen. Yeah. And it was just money was being put in through the park County community foundation and they were paying our bills of paying the processing. And then of course at the height of COVID, you know, all the money that the government had thrown around, uh, we applied for a $20,000 grant uh, through the, through the federal government or through the state government, which we got. Mm -hmm. Um, and we ran that through the park County community foundation to help pay for processing because by then so many animals were being dropped off. I mean, it was, it was like a, a revolving door here at the ranch, which was great. It was so cool to see everybody, you know, jumping in and helping out. And so 
at that point, so everything kind of happens all at once. And, and I mean, this really is a, a whirlwind of a story because we started donating all this hamburger and more and more people wanted to be a part of it and be on board. And so the TV out of Bozeman came out and did a little short story on us and they ran it statewide. And uh, who uh, the gentleman that is now our vice president, Dan Walker, saw it. He and his wife, Lisa, saw it in uh, Missoula. And he calls me up the next day and he's like, well, you don't know me from a hole in the ground, but I'm your first board member. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, okay, cool. Didn't need it. No, I needed a board yet, but that's probably, you know, we're probably headed that way because by then, you know, we had probably raised close to 50,000 um, and had really started to hit, you know, like 12,000 pounds delivered at that point. Mm-hmm. And it really was getting to be a big enough animal that my wife and I are like, oh gosh, we're going to have to get a 501c3 status, you know, we're going to have to really look into this stuff. And luckily, you know, again, luckily, uh, Dan Walker's best friend is a tax attorney in Missoula. And so they, he and his son really helped us get everything lined out in incredibly short order. I mean, we, so this whole idea started in April Mm -hmm. as just an idea, nothing more. And in six days, we delivered the first 700 pounds by October of 2020, we had our 501c3 status. We had all the paperwork filed and we had an official board of directors and bylaws on the whole works. Um, you need to yeah. run for office and, and go into government and, and take some of this efficiency that way. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think people would like me because <laughs> um, we so here's here's kind of a funny one. And, and I'll just go ahead and be blunt about it. Like. Our motto for our board is GSD, and uh, the the plate version is get stuff done. Yep. And and but that is we actually my wife and I had coffee mugs made up, really nice ones with our motto on it uh, for the board of directors. And really, if you want to get on the board or if you want to be a part of this project, you have to have the ability to get stuff done. Mm-hmm. And not in not in a month or two months, but like you know tomorrow and you know today that's kind of how we view things. And so we kind of went through, you know, 2020 getting money where we could of going to foundations and and really kind of reaching out to anybody and everybody that was like, Hey, we're trying to solve food insecurity and ranchers were donating and, you know, and, and producers were donating. We had pigs, we had cows. And obviously like the rest of the United States, we struggled with processing spots. Yes. Getting it you know, animals in. And we were like, oh my goodness, you know, we're going to have to, it just basically came down to me calling in a five state area around us, just calling anybody and everybody that would answer the phone and saying, Hey, can we get in? We're paying for the processing. I don't want it. I don't want a discount. I don't want anything. I just just want spots. And man, I had people that would actually hang up the phone while laughing at me. And so we just kept at it, kept at it. And we found, um, Trevor Abel at Yellowstone River Processing in Williston, North Dakota, of all places, mm-hmm. who, you know, they had just kind of bought it and they were expanding and they really wanted to be able to help out. He he bought into the whole mission, too. And, you know, he's like, oh, man, that's awesome. You know, I'll do what I can. And, and they really did, but it was expensive. And, you know, we ran, gosh, probably 50,000 pounds through Yellowstone River wow. um, last year alone. And, you know, I just, I would get all of the cows here at the ranch, I would get a full semi load and take them out there and they'd go to work. And, and, you know, they, he and his partner allowed me to drop them off at their feed lot and they would feed them and, and take care of them while they kind of got them through so that we didn't have to make multiple, multiple trips. Um, and we just did whatever it took. We, we called it year one. We were like, Hey, whatever it takes in year one, we're just going to get it done. And if it costs more, so be it. You know, we have to be able to prove that the concept will work. Like when you say, sorry, when you say it costs more, like, like what percentage, what percentage more than, than if you could have done it locally? And I understand there was that huge backlog, but like how much more ballpark? I would, I would say probably a dollar a pound more overall. And, and, you know, when you get into kind of the numbers that we were looking at, that's a lot of animals, Yes, a, a lot of money, you know, per animal. And so it was, it was what it was, right? We got it done though. And I think, um, you know, in our, in our first year, we had great success. There was, you know, that ability just to get things done, to get things moving forward. 
And we were pretty excited to be able to get to where we were in the first year. And I'm just kind of looking this up right now. In 2020, we donated uh, 53,345 pounds of hamburger. Holy so cow. From, yeah, so from April... Um, the end of April through the uh, the end of December, you know, we did just over 53,000 pounds. And we did all of that legitimately anywhere that we could get in through the door. Just anybody and everybody. I'm, You know, I called everybody around the state. You know, hey, if you have an opening, I have cows. If you have somebody back out, call me. I'll run them over with the trailer, you know, the same day if we have to. Um, and we'll just get it done. Mm -hmm. We'll just do what it takes. And And we were pretty excited to be able to reach that total in that short of a time. So obviously you're getting this done, but you've got a legit ranching operation to run. And it's, I would imagine in previous years, it's not like you were sitting around with a lot of time on your hands to, to, to just kind of do whatever. I mean, so, so how did you manage to, to run both businesses at once? I mean, how were you, how were you tending to your, your regular business of, of Highland livestock um, while also basically running a startup. I mean, it's almost like you day you had three job, three full-time jobs at once. Cause I would think the startup is the equivalent of two full-time jobs and maybe four cause ranching is its own double job. So like, how, how did that work? Yeah. I, it just, you just go at it. You just get it done. Oh, you just get it done. I don't know. You know, it's funny because I, uh, you know, being a soccer coach as well, you know, everybody always says, you know, and that's probably one of my biggest pet peeves in life, you know, people, I just don't have time. And I, I call total BS on that because you will make time for what you want to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you take out, you know, say an hour a night of watching TV. If you make that into productive time of just, you know, answering emails or, or designing, you know, the website, you know, we had some help from a kid in town, but you know, a lot of that stuff, you know, I've done that myself. Our, our merchandise page, I designed that entirely myself and, you know, you just find the time to get it done. And if it's important to you, you will make it work. And I am so lucky. I have such a good crew at the ranch. These guys, you know, I think a lot of times they're probably happier when I'm gone than when I'm around because <laughs> um, I drive them crazy. But they, they're they used to my sort of randomness and my my change of pace all the time. And, you know, they're they're great about this kind of stuff. And really this project, you know, it has expanded so much and it is – we are working so hard at filling so many little needs in one project. You know, it's, it is, it is ever constant. And so you just, you make time and, and some things do suffer. There is no doubt about that. There's only so many hours in the day, but again, I have a good crew to back me up. And so we just, we just go after it. And, and so when did the idea for the processing, your own processing facility come in? I mean, I, I imagine the idea may have come in early, but when did you decide all right, this is, we can do this. This is, uh, this is something we can execute on. Um, so we, we really looked at this idea of our own processing facility, oddly enough, pretty early on in the project, just because of the struggle that we faced with everybody else. And there were some facilities in our, in Montana that were for sale that, you know, that were inspected that were already up and running. And we kind of looked into that and I really thought about it and just decided, you know, guys, a, we have to we have to wait until we're we're a little more established, and B, we have to open our own. We can't buy one that's already in operation because calling all of the people that were already scheduled to have animals processed and tell them you no longer have a spot, you are out, mm -hmm. is is part of the problem. It's not part of the solution, and it would create a bigger void than what we would fix. And just in good conscience, we couldn't do that. That's not. That is not how you fix a problem by creating a bigger one. Mm -hmm. So we really, we sat down and we kind of backed off for about a month. <laughs> I, it makes it sound like it was so long, but we just, <laughs> for you, out. that is long. <laughs> yeah. And, and we just said, okay, that we're not going to, we're not going to tackle this problem. We're going to back up and we're going to figure out a better solution. And, and, you know, that struggle of finding processing for all these animals, we missed out on so many opportunities in 2020 um, just because we couldn't find room for them and people just didn't want to hold on to them, you know, and the logistics of everything. And so what really got to me is I ended up having to put two animals down here at the ranch that people had dropped off that I couldn't get in anywhere. And they just, 
their health deteriorated, you know, the, you know, one with a bad hip and one with a bad foot. And, and it, that was so frustrating to me because, you know, as a producer, we spend all this time taking care of the animals and doing the best that we can and trying to raise quality product. And we care about the animals so much. And to see that was just more than I could take. And so, you know, after the second one, I called Dan Walker, our vice president, and said, okay, we're going to open a facility by the end of 21. Mm-hmm. And more or less did a mic drop moment, hung up and said, all right, how are we going to do this? <laughs> so, so Dan and I really went after it, doing the research of trying to decide how to do it. You know, and again, a couple of the board members, you know, everybody's like, well, let's look at buying one that's in existence. And I was just adamant, absolutely not. And the other big part of this one is that to open the first ever federally inspected nonprofit purchased and operated processing facility is a huge undertaking. Yeah. You know, when you, when you jump into the realm of something that no one has ever done, it really gets interesting. And, oh, man, the number of people I've argued with, you know, they're like, oh, you should just get investors. It would be so much easier and you could be up and running by next year. And I'm like, so we can all agree that processing, food processing in the United States is, in, is a mess. It's turmoil. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, so your solution to that problem is to do the exact same thing that got us into that problem. I was like, fundamentally, that doesn't even make sense to me. When you step back and you take that 10,000 foot view look at it, I'm like, there is our problem, guys. You know, we go for convenience and quick money making. And that is why we are where we are as a country, is that we have allowed ourselves to get into this, this predicament. And I refuse to create, you know, another status quo operation. And so we really kind of have looked at this project from the beginning of adding value at every step of the way. So we look at it. So you bring me a cow and you donate a cow. Well, you're going to get the tax benefit based off the pounds of hamburger that are donated from that cow. Mm -hmm. And so right out of the gate, a producer is going to get a tax benefit on an old cow that a lot of times isn't even worth a thousand dollars. And, you know, we've averaged probably 350, 355 pounds of hamburger per, per larger animal. And, you know, for a lot of the times that the value of that hamburger is worth more than the value of the end. So right out of the gate, we're trying to offer ways to help ranchers and producers and farmers come up with better ways to to get value from their animals when they're done with their productive life. Yeah. And so we start there. OK, so then, the, you know, the hamburger goes in, you know, we get the money, we pay for the processing. The hamburger then goes into the Montana Food Bank Network, which once we got to the point that everybody within range of us here in Livingston were like, good Lord, man, enough hamburger. We did it. <laughs> um, I called the Montana food bank network. And I think at first they kind of thought I was a little bit loony, but only for a brief moment, because I said, well, I have a trailer with 12,000 pounds of hamburger that I'm going to bring to Missoula. And we're going to do a big TV deal and we're going to really kick this thing off. Right. And those guys have been in, have been the best partners in all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, They have jumped on board. They have helped promote us. They have, they have used some of their own money to, to print up boxes with our logo on it. So I can send it to the processor so that, you know, we don't have to pay for boxes as well. And they, since then they have picked up everything for us. Every time we get something done, they show up with a truck, they pick it up, they take it to Missoula. They distribute it out to the 240 member partners. I think they have around the state of Montana. And what's really amazing to me at this point is we've donated, uh, I think total right now, just over 85,000 pounds of hamburger total since the start of the project. Myself, personally, I have yet to hand out a single pound of hamburger. Really? Um, Yeah. All we do and all we wanted to do from day one was to help the people that are already doing the work, was to provide them with a high quality Montana grown product that, that they could hand out to the people that they're already working with. And we're just trying to help put air in the tires. And so we've really kind of, you know, along with their help and, you know, getting those guys to do it, we've tried, like I said, we were trying to do all this added value for every step of the way. So the first big delivery that we did to the Montana food bank network, the, the amount of money that they saved from having to buy a hamburger they were able to turn around and buy a full semi load of turkeys for Thanksgiving. Wow. And so instant return. I mean, just the impact is, you know, 
it starts out as a ripple and ends up as a wave by the time it gets done. And, you know, on top of that, what we are doing is we are doing whole animal hamburger. So the quality of the product that we are putting out is way better than, than really just about anything that you can even buy in the grocery store. You know, so that part of it, you know, getting a, getting a quality protein out to those in need is even, even a better deal. I mean, it is, it is such a neat, neat project from the start to the finish to be able to do that kind of you know, quality and that everything else that kind of goes with it. I had a, uh, a guy that I don't, I actually texted him, um, when I found out I was going to be talking with you and it, his name is Matt Scoglin and he runs a bison ranch kind of in your area. And he actually knows yep. one of your, your colleagues. And I had him on the podcast maybe six, seven months ago. And he was talking about the challenges with meat processing in Montana and beyond and just what a, what a mess it was and the need for exactly what you're doing right now. And he's a big fan of everything you're doing, by the way. But one of the things that I remember of that conversation is just, he was talking about a lot of the red tape that can be involved with getting a processing facility off the ground. How has that been like dealing with all these, what I would imagine is a lot of federal red tape to get this processing facility off the ground? Um, so the, the federal side of it uh, has been really easy. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, no, that part has been amazing. Those guys, you know, we, we sent in all the paperwork and they, you know, sort of like a, a, an inquiry, if you will, and said, hey, we're going to be doing this. Here's, here's what we're doing. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's what we want to build, how we want to operate it, the whole nine yards. And uh, they... Not only did they reach out to us, but actually the regional inspector came, actually stopped by last spring and really looked at the site with me and really kind of talked through what we were going to do and, and really laid out what we needed to get done ahead of time, all of which we've done. And, you know, when I went to fill out all the paperwork, they were super helpful in making sure that we got it right the first time. And from that standpoint, those guys were really easy to work with. That's great. Um, you know, and, and granted... We are doing something a little bit different. We are going to have a brand new facility, one that is, you know, built just for this. It is a modular unit, and so it comes in four pods. And so this is a very unique thing that they are definitely watching because they're like, wow, this is really cool. We want to see how it works and kind of see how you operate it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so obviously in the interest factor in all of this is high. And so they, they've been very engaged from day one. You know, uh, being out in the county and out in the middle of nowhere, kind of figuring out the rest of it has been a little bit of a hurdle. Um, getting the power figured out has probably probably been the biggest hurdle. Um, and, and so, but we're working through it all. And it's just a matter of sort of having that determination to get it done and to get it operational. And so I would say, you know, yes, there are hurdles, but they are not impossible to overcome. Mm -hmm. And if you are really open and you are willing, and I think probably one of the bigger factors is to, I, I guess the way that I call it, anybody that we work with, I tell everybody, everything that we do has to pass the mom test. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, what the mom test is, knowing what we're doing, you know, processing animals is not, not an easy job. It's not a clean job. But I want everybody to be proud enough of what we're doing that they would bring their mom by and show her our facility. Yep. And by having that mentality of, hey, we want this to be super clean. We don't want it to smell. You know, we want people to be able to and be able to tour it and feel really confident about where their food is coming from and how it's taken care of. And so we've really taken that approach. And, and you know, so many people are so excited to hear that and they want to be a part of that. It really does make it easier to kind of get through this stuff because, you know, we don't want to cut corners. We don't want to try to, you know, be sneaky about anything. We just want to do what's right and do it in the best way possible. And I am really adamant just that, that this whole project, that everything, that we can prove that there are better ways to do things, that we don't have to deal with status quo, that that's not good enough. And, you know, when you have that mentality, people want to be a part of it. And it makes it kind of exciting. So as, you know, as it seems that, you know, I think COVID is here to stay, um, but, but it, it seems that we're, we're past the absolute worst of it. I mean, I think there, there are obviously flare ups um, with different variants and there probably will be, but, but as this, you know, hopefully things get back to somewhat normal 
and people are not, the food banks are not being stressed out like they were. I mean, where do you see the opportunity for this nonprofit to go in the future as hopefully people don't need, aren't needing food to survive, but, but there's still obviously a, a great need for, for healthy local food. Absolutely. And there, you know, there will always be those that need, need help. Yep. You know, people just have, it, that is life. There's always going to be people that just need a hand up and that, you know, that part will never change. But here is how I view this whole project and kind of everything as a whole. The state of Montana, the Montana Food Bank Network, in, the year before we started, they they purchased about 140,000 pounds of hamburger that they donated and sent around the state. And so we kind of backed this whole project up and looked at it and said, okay, how do we go about coming up with 150,000 pounds of hamburger a year that we can donate direct to the Montana Food Bank Network so they never have to buy protein again? Mm-hmm. And so we really kind of started from that point. And once we started looking at our own facility, I started doing other numbers and different things. And so here is kind of my my overall view of the project in the future. Montana is a state with 3 million cows in it right now. And if you take 3 million cows uh, that we have, and every year 8% of those are culled, taken out of the productive herd and sold, that's roughly 240,000 animals every year. If I could get 1,000 animals donated a year, on the average with you know the, the number of pounds that we get out of animals, we could easily take care of everything that the Montana Food Bank Network needs and have enough to provide hamburger to every school in the state of Montana wow. on an annual basis. And all of these things that we see all of the time. You know, we would be able to put in such a good, high quality protein and all of the studies out there that show that how much better kids can learn and and do when they have good quality food is there it's easy to find and it's easy to see and you know we could be standing on the edge of of really figuring out ways to help bridge all of those gaps that we see all over do you see that this is a model that could be scaled throughout throughout the west or not even the west throughout throughout the country because i feel like in my work in conservation obviously we want to the funders like to uh like to fund things that help local communities, but they get even more excited if it's helping the local community and is creating a model that other co- communities could use over a, a, a huge area. I mean, is that do you foresee this being something that could be replicated? Absolutely. Um, everything that we've done is, is based on that model and that ideal of being able to replicate what we're doing in other states. And we've had other states reach out to us and, hey, we would love for you guys to do what you're doing here. And, you know, my response is always, hey, that's awesome, and we'll look into it. But after we get up and running and figuring out what we're doing, mm-hmm. um, you know, as Dan likes to put it, you know, we are building an airplane while we're flying it at this point. And that, produ- you know, that presents a lot of really unique challenges. But down the road, you know, once we get this running and we figure out how to do it, um, you know, I think that the sky is the limit at that point because. So there are so many layers to this overall concept. You know, we are going to have the ability of doing 15, the equivalent of 15 cows a day, so 45 cows a week. And obviously that's way more than we would ever need to be able to do everything that we do for donated animals. And part of our program is we are going to be doing custom cutting as well. And what we want to work with are all of these people, these direct-to-consumer producers out there that are you know, selling online and they're selling at uh, at farmers markets and, you know, restaurants and that different stuff. But they really struggle having a consistent processing spot because we just don't have that many, you know, inspected facilities. And we want to be able to work with those guys um, to be able to help them have consistent spots um, and also to be able to make some money so that we can actually afford to run this thing without having to go out and get all the money that we need to operate it every year. Mm-hmm. And you know, so many of these facilities nowadays, you know, they charge a down payment in order to hold a, hold their spot and, you know, different things and the prices are going up. And, you know, our goal is going to be, hey, if you want to be part of our partnership, you have to donate a certain number of pounds of hamburger out of each animal that we process of yours, you know, and then you pay for the processing and, and they'll get the tax benefit. We'll get a little bit of hamburger out of each one and, and help towards our overall mission. You know, and then the rest of the time we do the animals that are donated 
you know, we feel that we can meet all of the goals that we really want to try to set out. And, and again, it's just another way of trying to do added value at, at every step, at everything that we do. I love the part about figuring out a way to make it financially sustainable. And that, that brings me to my next question I wanted to ask you about fundraising. I mean, obviously, you know how to work very hard. You know how to work very efficiently. You're able to take big ideas and execute them, which a lot of people are not able to do. But at the end of the day, to do all this, it takes a lot of money you know, to, to get something like this off the ground. Can you talk a bit about how you went about fundraising? Because I know that there are a lot of people listening to this podcast that are in you know one non one version of a nonprofit or another, and money is always the issue there. So, I mean, you you, you spoke about it a little bit at the beginning about how it just kind of word spread and and there was excitement building. But what do you think accounts for your success in fundraising? I mean, obviously it's a great idea, but there are a lot of great ideas out there. Um, again, a lot of luck. <laughs> You know, You're know, humble. <laughs> and, and, uh, well, but no joke. I like, you know, we have a business partner that, that was, I was so fortunate to get to work with over the years and to be able to go to their foundation and say, Hey, we really need the lead gift to kick this, this project off. And it's something that I feel very passionate about of being able to give back to the, to the agricultural community and, and really to everyone. Um, you know, it speaks to such a wide range of people. It's an easy sell in that department. And, you know, to be able to have them come on board and a couple other big foundations in our area come on board. And really, it's just been a lot of filling out paperwork, getting on the phone or going in person and talking to people and <laughs> raising money. And, you know, the start was really easy because during COVID, people really couldn't go anywhere. So I had a really good captive audience. <laughs> However, you know, the moment that everything kind of opened up, it did slow down. People And people still want to help, but they're just like, oh, yeah, we'll get around to looking at it. And it just, it's taken longer to kind of do the end part of it, you know, just because I, no joke, because of that factor, people are just out doing stuff again. And we kind of got put on the back burner in a lot of people's minds, which I fully understand. It's not, it's not the end of the world. We're still going to get this project done. Um, so yeah, yeah. You know, I think just being able to talk to people to show them what we're doing and more than anything, really unique situation, the proof of concept. So from day one, you know, let's go back to the first week, right? We came up with the idea and within six days, we donated 700 pounds of hamburger. Yep. So we, we proved that it could be done. So then that took care of one town, you know, for a short duration, obviously. But as more animals came in, we started to reach out. We started taking care of more towns and the Montana Food Bank Network gets on board. You know, next thing you know, we've donated over 50,000 pounds around the state. Then we've proven that it can be a statewide opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that, that success of, of what we called year one, of doing whatever it takes, of not saying no. You know, some guy has one cow out in the middle of nowhere. You know, we don't say, well, that's, that's too much, we, you know, too far. We didn't do that. We went and got the animal. And, mm -hmm. you know, hence the reason we spent a little more than we should. But we proved that if we all work together – that we can make that that idea work. And so having that proof of concept at each step, you know, from from small, you know, one town, local county to, you know, multiple counties to statewide, you know, and then again, eventually, as you pointed out, going sort of into a bigger circle even at some point, um, having that proof of concept has helped so much to be able to go back to people and say, look, this isn't an idea that we want to, hope to try we are we are pitching it as this is what we are doing we need help to get better at it and and that helped out a ton one qu question kind of zooming out a bit is more of like a, a theoretical question but um you know i think a lot of people who are not deeply involved in ranching communities or, or in you know some of the the rural areas of the west like say people sitting on the East coast, they read books about the West and they, they have hear this idea about rugged individualism and how everybody out here is kind of doing their own thing. And they, they are almost like an Island on their land. But one of the things you keep saying, the word that keeps coming up over and over and over is, is community. And I feel like you obviously place a big value in community. You have this great network. And when I was looking, you know, doing research, it seems like you're involved in everything from, you know, the school board to obviously coaching soccer to Trout Unlimited, I believe. And so where did this, uh, where did this like commitment to community come from? Because it's obvious that that is 
very, very, very important to you. And I think most people would think it's important, but most people don't act on it like you, you do. So like, where did that come from? Oh man, that's a good, that's a really good question. And, and one that I probably don't have the best answer in the world. I, you know, growing up out where I did and getting to be so lucky to grow up here, you know, things were not always easy Mm -hmm. and working with family can be one of the toughest things. And really growing up as a kid, it was my community that helped me get through everything. Um, You know, knowing that I had, you know, my soccer team that I could rely on and, and all of the friends that I had, it just, I think that it helped me learn as a young kid of what that really meant of having people look out for you. And I think that being the luckiest person you've ever met, and the reason I feel that I am that way too, is I don't push it. I don't try to overdo it. And we try to do things to give back, to share with people. Um, You know, there are so many amazing people in this world that, that do so much. And it's, you know, that is fun to meet them because you look at a lot of the producers and the people that donate, a lot of them that donate animals, they donate their time and their money to different to different schools, to different charities, you know, and they're a part of something. And I get so fed up with people thinking that we are just, that ranchers and farmers and ag people are just these rich, you know, wealthy snobs. And it's really the exact opposite. A lot of these guys own a lot of land, but they don't have much cash. And they give everything that they can. And they do everything that they can to help their communities because, Knowing that, you know, a a healthy community helps our business as well Mm -hmm. is fundamental of what we do. And, you know, to think that one can exist without the other is just crazy. Yeah. And, you know, some of the people that give the most have the least. And, you know, that's a testament to the American West. That is what what really, you know, and especially in Montana, you know, I love this area. And I'm sure that other places in the country are are really not different. Um, It's just that. I talk about cows and I talk about Montana because that's what I know. I mean, that's where, you know, my whole educational life has been is right here. And so, but, and I'm sure that it's the same everywhere. You know, the people that just, that, that live off the land understand, you know, to a deeper level what it takes and what that community around them, what it needs to survive. Again, in my Google stalking, which would have been very weird if I were not preparing for a podcast, (laughs) I found this super cool video of you, and I believe it was a a John Deere uh, produced video. And I got to see some of your your property and and you were just talking about your life and your operation and your family. And there was a part in there, if I'm remembering correctly, where you said your dad, your dad was, um, you know, a great man and, and very interested in in building a big ranch and that you personally, you like to focus on building the best ranch and you want to be the best. And so like, how do you define best? What does that, what does best mean to you when it comes to, to running a a agricultural operation? I think that, you know, and man, I can fully admit that if I was a young kid or a teenager or a young adult today, I would probably be diagnosed with ADD and be put on medication, (laughs) um, hands down. The thing that I love about agriculture is how many different things that we have to know. Yeah. It's not, you know, we aren't, I can't be just a farmer. I cannot be just a, an animal expert. I, you know, we have to be able to understand accounting. We have to be able to understand computers. We have to be able to understand animal husbandry i have to understand how farming works you know irrigation fertilizing feeding animals um just the whole the whole works you know from genetics to to just everything that there is and you look at the a year cycle in ranching you focus on so many different things at different times of the year you know when you start calving you spend you know 60 days and and probably 45 of those days you almost don't even remember because you spend them all with your cows every day you know trying to assist in calving and taking care and making sure everybody's healthy and then all of a sudden you're into spring work and you're you're irrigating and you're helping things grow and you're fencing and you're and you know along with all of that you have to be able to to understand the relationship that we have with wildlife Uh, we have to understand the relationship that we have with people that are recreating you know, and, and all of those different factors. And when you look at the American West, you know, those individuals that can do that well, man, those are some really cool people. 
to be able to do all of those different things and understand the relationship, just not many people really fully understand how many different hats we have to wear in this industry and, and in this business. And I think that that part of it is what what really drives me more than anything of being able to do that. And and I love to learn. And, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like you alluded to of being, um, you, you know, on different boards from school boards to trout and limited boards to just different things. And, you know, learning how different people view the world and different things of that nature. And so, you know, you take all of that back and I, how do I view being the best is that is taking care of the land as well as we can, knowing that we are just a small blip on the radar of life, of yep. the overall, you know, we don't want to ruin what we have. Anybody who thinks that, that a good rancher and farmer is going to abuse the land is obviously not paying attention because that is how they make a living. That is what they take care of. And if, if they truly want to say that they are generational, then they have to know that they're going to be leaving everything to their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids. And you want to leave something that is sustainable. You want want something that they can have when you're done that is as good or better. And that goes into every aspect of it from, from raising your cows to picking your bulls to what alfalfa you plant to how you irrigate to looking at alternative, you know, energy sources or, you know, different ways of doing things and how to, be better every day and you know one of my favorites is you know you talk to people and well my great-grandfather did it this way and that's why we do it and i'm like well you know your great-grandfather was wrong and you've just compounded that issue by being wrong again today. <laughs> and you know you, we can't we can't hold on to those ideals all the time we can hold on to the core values of what we do of work hard you know and things of that nature but but we have to be aware of how all of those interactions, you know, affect everything. And if we don't, we're only kidding ourselves. We're not going to be here very long. We just won't be. You know, it's a tangible thing. It's not it's not who makes the best the most money. It's not who raises the best cows. It's that overall picture. Yeah, that's that's very well said and and super inspiring. And so um you, you've got boys that you know, I'm not sure if they have interest in in taken over whenever you decide to to walk away. But like, I mean, where do you think agriculture is going? Because like, I would imagine over the course of your career, you've seen some pretty big shifts in whether it's technology or markets or, you know, prices, you know, the, the consolidation of a lot of these meat, meat processing companies. I mean, where do you, if you had to forecast out or when you're talking to your boys, assuming they have an interest in it, where do you see things going um, for for a producer of, of your scale? Oh, gosh, if only I had a crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, and, and that is the question that I ask myself daily. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I think you hit on a big one. Technology has been a huge part of this. So, you know, we run on more ground with fewer people and more cows with fewer people and just everything with less. Yeah. And you know, we have tractors that can drive themselves in a straight line. My irrigation, almost all of our irrigation, once we get everything up and running in the spring, I can do it all from my phone as I drive by. <laughs> Isn't and that crazy? It is. It is absolutely amazing. All of our cows have electronic ID. I can scan a cow and tell you her whole history, where she came from, what, you know, what calves she's had, you know, and we're working on getting it down so I can even tell you what pasture she's been in at what time. And, you know, that... That is going to help us to not only be better at what we what we do, but more transparent. And I think that as we move forward with the movements that we are seeing, that your average consumer is we are starting to get back to that phase of life where people want to know where their food came from. Yeah. And have a better understanding that that not only where it came from, but was it taken care of properly? And there are so many of these guys out here, these producers that do all of that. They really do care, but they don't have the ability to show it yet. And we need to start looking at that. Like, I am a, I am a huge proponent of electronic identification. Um, I I think that branding our cows is prehistoric and wrong. Mm. Because here we are. We are in the business of, of raising high quality, you know, as low stress animals as we can. And one of the biggest traditions in the West is branding. And I am absolutely against it because it goes against really every core value that we have. Mm -hmm. And I realize that it's an identification mark and all of this, but I'm like, dang, 
we can put a tile on our damn keys, and if I lose my keys, I can hit a button on my phone, and it'll take me right to them. Yeah. So the technology is there. The, you know, we, we are getting to that point that we can change this narrative and even be better at what we do and have a better product at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, technology is going to play a huge role in this. You know, you look at, for example, our facility, when an animal comes in and we start the process and by the time we cut it down into halves, it will have a tag that we will put on the on the carcass that will keep track of everything that animal through the whole facility that happens, you know, whether it be taking the temperature checks and everything, it will log them automatically all the way to when it gets to our cut and wrap room. And, and uh, you know, the employee has a half a beef hanging on the rail there. They can scan it. And on the big monitor screen on the wall, it's going to tell them exactly what the customer wanted, how they wanted it cut up and how to package everything. And it'll be all right there. So we won't have to worry about losing paper, or losing anything like that. It'll all be right there. And, you know, the more that we encourage this use of technology, the better the end product will be for everybody. I think what you said about people wondering, you know, wanting to know where their food c- comes from. I think that's one of the silver linings of COVID, you know, not, not much good has come out of the last few years. I mean, as far as there have been a lot of people suffering and a lot of people dying, obviously, but I remember, you know, about the time you started your project, um, you go in the grocery store and the, the, the shelves were empty or, or very, very sparsely stocked. And I think people, people who had never once considered where their food came from all of a sudden got a rude awakening about the importance of local food or at least food produced within the borders of the United States. And so, um, I think I've, I've found in my work that that's been a, a good thing, um, as far as raising awareness. So, um, I was glad to hear you say that as well. Um, can you, I mean, this is another kind of high level question, but would you have ever imagined that your life, that you'd be doing what you're doing now? I mean, it seems like you had a very full life in, in 2019 and now you've, you have basically created this whole new way of doing things very, very quickly. I mean, is this a complete surprise to you? (laughs) Uh, yes. I never thought that I would start a nonprofit. I mean, that just was really the farthest thing from my mind when we set out on this. The idea was just how do we help our neighbors? And it's really exploded from there. And and, but I think that the true core value of that idea has been the driving point behind all of this, because, you know, having our own processing facility so that we can do more animals so that we can help more producers. You know, that's still at the core value of helping our neighbors Mm -hmm. and keeping it all local, you know, keeping it right here. We don't. And to me, that was really important. When we started, when we sat down and we were like, okay, we're going to be a 501c3. One of the big parts of this to me was, okay, we are not going to wait for the government to give us money to do this or to show us how to do this. We are going to go out and show people that we can help each other without government involvement, that we don't need that. And quite honestly, it's easier without them. And I think that to me, that is really important that that you are absolutely correct. COVID has exposed so many flaws and everything, and there is so much turmoil. But in order for things to get better, it had to get worse first. We had to expose those issues. Now let's go out and start coming up with the solutions. And that is really one of the big driving factors for us was, okay, so we know the problem. Let's create a whole new solution that nobody's ever done before and and go down a, a new road and try to show people that we can help each other without all of the other BS that gets surrounded by it, that we can just go out and do good things, but we can also do it in a manner that's helpful all the time. So many of the nonprofits that I talk to, and this is no direct you know, bashing on anybody, but so many of them get so much money, but they don't really do anything. And, mm-hmm. You know, like, gosh, one of them came to us right at the very beginning and they wanted to give us a bunch of money to do a feasibility study. And I just laughed. I'm like, seriously, you think I need to do a feasibility to study to see that people are hungry? <laughs> I think I, I think we already know that. Point. Yeah. There's no sense wasting money and time doing a feasibility study. How about we just go start fixing the problem? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you really want me to hang up a phone quickly, just start talking about feasibility studies. <laughs> I just lose all interest. I can't. I don't. In my world, I don't understand them. I don't get them. And I, and I get that there's a a place for them in the world, but just not in my world. And I'm just like, Oh my goodness. We know that we need process and we know people are hungry. We know that there are people that need help. We know that there are so many cull animals from the, from our area that are better made into hamburgers than selling them for 
pennies on the dollar through the ring. And so you really start looking at all this and I'm just like, goodness gracious, here is a solution. It's right there in front of us. And all we have to do is be willing to go out and make a change. And, and I, you know, yeah, let's admit it. This is a big one. You know, we're right in the middle of a $2.5 million capital campaign to build our processing facility. But on the flip side, if I called you up and I said, hey, and if you had $2.5 million you could give me and I could end hunger in an entire state permanently, would you be interested? <laughs> and that, that usually changes the conversation right there. People are like, oh, dang, that's a different way of looking at it. And so I, I have always tried to take problems and, and look for alternative solutions. And probably one of the best way, tricks that I have in my life that I have done is, you know, you know the problem. And I know what the end, where the end is. And so I actually start from there and work my way backwards to figure out how to get started. You know, rather than trying to start, figure out how you want it to end and then get to your starting point. Mm -hmm. So much easier. It saves so much trouble. And, you know, we've really approached this whole facility and everything we're doing that way. We want to be able to do our own hamburger. All right. How do we do that? You know, so what box does it look like? You know, and then, then just work back to the beginning and. And then all of a sudden it's, it's here, which I realize makes it sound overly simple, but that really is the approach that we took. I love it. You're getting me all, uh, motivated and kind of keyed up. And I think I, I can only imagine what it's like to be on your soccer team. I bet those, I bet those young ladies are, are <laughs> keyed up. <laughs> uh, most days I'd like to think so. Not everybody, not everybody can, can, you know, handle my brand of energy. I get that. It's Okay. You know, not everybody will like you. That's that's kind of how life goes, and that's good. You know, I think that, you know, one of my best features that I love in life is, you know, if you surround people, yourself with people that agree with you 100% of the time, you'll never get challenged. Yes, I agree completely. You know, you can't, you can't have just yes people around you. That just doesn't work. And don't be a yes person. I mean, my goodness, nobody wants to hear that, you know, and... <laughs> But don't be a negative Nelly either. You know, what I what I love is how do we fix the problem? Whatever it is, even if it's something small, how do we fix it? Yeah, we know it's a problem, but how do we fix it? Come with a solution. Come with ideas that we can work together on. I love it. I love it. And and so I got two kind of quick final questions, and I'm going to let you get back to doing important stuff instead of talking to me. I love giving people that listen to this podcast kind of resources that they can go to and direct them so they, they listen to you, they get all excited, they want to learn more, and then they can go to the website and, and find different things that you had mentioned. And so are there any books – that have been impactful to your life, um, whether related to agriculture or business or history, you know, are there, it, it, a lot of times I ask people about their favorite books about the American West, but it's really whatever books have helped shape your worldview and, and help you be who you are. So does any, any titles come to mind? Yeah, I would say, um, Lonesome Dove. As oh, I love it. I love that book. Probably, probably would have been like as a kid growing up out here, of course, we had no TV, you know, internet, cell phones, those weren't even a thing back then. And so what did we do? We read books and I, I loved reading books. And actually, it is legitimately probably one of the few Westerns that I ever read. And I ended up reading it um, more because it was the only book in the house I hadn't read. Yeah. <laughs> And fell in love with it. I mean, I even as a kid, you know, pre-high school, I read the whole thing. And I remember when the TV series came out or the movie came out that, you know, that they did on TV. And I was so excited. And I absolutely loved the TV series when they did it because it was the first time that I had ever seen a TV series that actually followed a book. Sure. I mean, it legitimately followed the book. And I was so excited. Like, if I remember right, it was like a two-week event of – you know, like an hour a night or something like that. And oh, man, I made sure I got my homework done and I was ready so that I could watch Lonesome Dove. And, you know, it was like right when we had first got the first satellite TV out here at the ranch. And so, you know, everything sort of lined up for me. So that one was huge for me um, growing up to be able to do that. And probably um, another good one for, and boy, talk about being off um, the beaten path was everything your coach never told you about soccer because you're a girl ah. <laughs> uh, by Dan Blank. Uh, and, and 
you know, just really a no nonsense way of looking at soccer and kind of his views as a coach. And that was a really good one too. Um, obviously I've had tons of books in my life that really made a difference, but I, I, I could probably point to those two as being pretty darn good ones. I love Lonesome Dove, and I wish I'd read the second one because I used to coach um, high school JV soccer, uh, girls soccer back in the day, and uh, I loved it. It was one of the most rewarding, fun experiences. Those girls, not only did nobody, nobody had any memory of them ever winning a game, nobody can remember the last time that team had scored a goal, and I think we ended up winning like three games. So I was, I considered it a, a success, and they had fun. So I got a soft spot Absolutely. for coaching. <laughs> Um, all right. Last question. Then I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you get back to it. Uh, the people who listen to this podcast, they, they just love the American West in one way or another, whether that's through agriculture, conservation, athletics, literature, and they're just curious folks. And so do you have any kind of parting words of wisdom and and ask, uh, something you like to ask of the listeners, any, any way you'd like to wrap this up? I think probably one of the biggest things, and I always try to teach all my kids and even my own two boys that, that everyone can make a change. Um, you know, even high school kids, I get this question, you know, how can I make the world better? How about you walk in the door tomorrow and you go up to somebody that you never talked to and you just say, Hey, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Just something small, start out with something easy. Everybody can help make the world a better place. We don't all have to start nonprofits. It doesn't have to all be huge. And in fact, if, you know, if you imagine if everybody in the United States did 10 hours of free community work a month or a year even just a year think of what we could get done Mm -hmm. and all it takes is one person that it's so simple it just takes one person even just saying hi to somebody that looks like they're having a bad day it would make such a difference in everything that we could do and that would be man if i could ask one thing of everybody donate an hour of your time see the difference it'll make it will change your life I love it. I think that's a great way to wrap it up. How can people find out more about you, about the producer partnership? Where should people look on the internet? I'll have links to everything in the, in the episode notes, but where, where should they go? Uh, producerpartnership.com. And it has pretty much everything that we do on there. We try to kind of keep it updated. It has, man, if you want to call me, it has all my information on there. We're pretty open about what we're doing, where we're headed and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's all there. Well, this is inspiring stuff on many, many, many levels for me. Everything from learning about agriculture and to coaching soccer. I've got two young girls, too, that are just getting into sports. And so um, I really appreciate everything you're doing. I appreciate all the, the words of wisdom and uh, good luck with everything. Keep me in the loop and let me know if I can ever help. Yeah. And if I could, there's going to be one other question that you're going to get a ton of. Um, and that I get a ton of that I'd like to just really quickly address. And that is going to be the workforce issue that we're going to face in opening our own facility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing this all across the United States. The skilled labor force is disappearing at a rapid pace. And obviously we know that we're going to have a mountain to climb on making sure that we have people that will be able to do this job. And, And we all know that it's not a clean job. It's not an easy job. So our approach is rather than going out and trying to recruit people to come and work, we are actually going to be, once we get up and running, we're going to open our own school. And one of my goals is that we will actually have housing on site. We are going to pay people to come to school for six months. Uh, We plan on getting it accredited through a university and get it to the point that somebody who doesn't even have a home can come here, work for six months, will have a place to live, will leave here with money in their pocket and an education. And so rather than trying to fight to find a workforce, we're going to educate the workforce and send them back out across our country to try to make a better difference. Man, it keeps getting better. We need to catch up a year from now. There's no telling what you'll be doing then. I mean, this is, it's, it's just wild, the uh, the progress you're making in such a short amount of time. And like I said earlier, everybody, you know, plenty of people have great ideas, but being able to turn those ideas into a reality that is the trick and you've obviously you're obviously doing it every day so i really admire it man i really appreciate it and um keep up the great work well thank you so much and thank you for the time i really appreciate it hey it's ed again thanks so much for listening to the podcast i know your time is valuable so it means the world that you spend it listening if you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow There are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. 
Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread. So I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you can go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon. And there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prey stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four, I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally, check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprairie.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn. So look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support.